Um, I'm curious, though, well, how come uh, you're here, or what's the um, what's your particular interest in this in this class? Uh, are people here because they know of Ed Sanders' work, or how many here know his work already? Uh, as uh, how many know it as from uh, know of him as a poet? And how, how many know of, of him from the Fugs? So I know you're pretty, most are pretty familiar with this. Is there anyone here who has not heard any of his work but is just interested in the concept of investigative poetics? Which is in itself interesting. Yeah. When well, it came to the right place. <laughs> uh, the, the notion of investigative poetics is something I think that um, Ed invented out of the uh, work of other people before him and out of his own uh, wit and uh, experience in the political movements of the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, he was one of the f first pacifist, activist, anti-war um, performers. Uh, uh, he came from the Catholic worker movement originally and work with Dorothy Day back in the late 50s. I think he was originally from uh, Kansas City and got turned on by uh, Howell, I think, actually, in uh, a lot of beat literature, and then uh, decided to come to New York and see the big Bohemian village. And, and then immediately got involved because he was sort of a, a scholarly to begin with got involved with uh, classical studies so that he can read Egyptian hieroglyphs as well as Greek and Latin. So he's a scholar. And um, he got and an activist. He got involved with uh, swimming out and climbing on top of the first Polaris submarines in New London Harbor back in 1960. So he's actually been on the spot, sort of been awake and on the spot and naked in the ocean of actuality for some time. Then in 19, um, when I was in India in 63, 62, I hadn't um, heard of him or anything, but I got uh, rumors uh, and then a letter from him about, rumors of and a letter from him about his magazine, which was called Fuck You Slash Bar, a magazine of the arts which was, at the time, such a funny notion and bold, because nobody had gone that far in the title to be so overtly um, iconoclastic and comical. And I, at the same time, very elegantly, because it's a fuck you slash bar. <laughs> it's like an Olsen poem or something. And then a magazine of the arts. Not fuck you, a magazine. Uh, now, I keep seeing it actually uh, uh, vulgarly described as Ed Sanders' magazine, Fuck You. But it's not that. It was Fuck You slash bar, a magazine of the arts. <laughs> so everybody got turned on by that. Who was um, get, uh, everybody in, say, the San Francisco or the Black Mountain or the New York School who were wondering what was the next step after the, the big uh, poetry renaissance that was... Um, solidified by Don Allen's anthology of 1960 that was recommended to you today for it, the projected verse text. And I think Ed provided the next big impetus from the sort of academic classical accomplishment of literary revolution to like another push into the 60s with that title of total frankness and humor. So it was a humor or like a mind zap uh, on uh, not only on the poets, but on uh, the readership, and uh, on readers and on professors, because his idea was to have Fuck You, a magazine of the arts with contributions by Olson and Robert Duncan and Denise Levertov and myself and Peter Olofsky and Leroy Jones, so that it would be absolutely necessary for all bibliophiles and university libraries to order Fuck You, a magazine of the arts, <laughs> <laughs> lest they uh, miss out on, on, on this item, which is now worth like $200 a copy for, for the first issue. And he knew it and they knew it. That, that was like, um, so he was taking advantage of the cultural situation and of the, uh, with a great deal of confidence in the um, fact that it was like a, 
a wave of the future, or a wave of the present that was, that was uh, cresting, a wave of frankness, uh, humor, uh, mental revolution, or consciousness revolution, a uh, revolution of words, certainly. And his concept was word zap. That is a, a sort of psychedelic or mind manifesting notion that the, the word could zap your mind or zap your brain and actually make brain changes or neurological changes or changes of perception. Ultimately, changes of uh, behavior, thus changes of history, make changes in history. And uh, actually, his word was zap, you know, that word zap, which is used a lot in gossip columns or even out of the White House now. Uh, that, that, uh, that verb, the use of that verb was Sanders' contribution in, in uh, his early Lemar newsletters, which he edited, or Fuck You, a Magazine of the Arts. Um, he had a whole bunch of little um, mimeographed quasi-political, quasi-literary activist publications which emanated from a backyard back house on Avenue Way between 12th and 13th Street in the Lower East Side, which oddly enough, I can see at present from my kitchen window from the apartment where I live in New York. I think he moved there in 62 or three or something uh, and set up the Peace Eye Bookshop on 10th Street between Avenue B and Avenue C, which was about a half a block from where I was living, so that we were neighbors. And uh, <clears throat> that was the beginning of the amphetamine crisis. So there were a lot of amphetamine heads hanging around his bookshop because it had an Egyptian Horus eye on the window. And uh, the amphetamine heads of that era were naturally attracted to anything that looked a little bit mystical. <laughs> <laughs> particularly on an old, an old butcher shop which had Hebrew kosher lettering on it, <laughs> renamed Pisai with an Egyptian sign. <clears throat> but one thing that was weird about it was that the place kept, you couldn't tell wh whether it was uh, speed freaks or undercover police, the, pl the place kept getting ransacked. Or I think once burned out and a few times ransacked and busted into. And there were all sorts of goons occasionally hanging out. Uh, posing as um, Hell's Angels or as uh, Peace Eye uh, Nudniks or uh, Enforcers, Peace Enforcers, or uh, Wandering Itinerant Minstrel Gorillas or <laughs> whatever. But a, a mixture of weird riffraff and juvenile delinquents as well as Tuli Kupfer Berg or myself or Peter Orlovsky or Frank O'Hara or Leroy Jones coming by because he had a good bookstore carrying all the City Lights books and all the Totem Corinth books and all of all back copies of Eugene magazine, uh, all the little uh, uh, iconography of the late 50s of poetic, poetic and prose revolution. Uh, plus a lot of uh, Marxist analysis of uh, the Rockefeller interests, uh, whatever material there was around uh, of um, left-wing newspapers or um, Mm, masses and mainstream publications, or uh, what later became, I guess, a, was it NACLA, N-A-C-L-A? Does anybody know that? National, what's the? Na National, and yeah, uh, I, I think a Harvard-based um, research group, Cambridge-based research group run by a guy named Michael Clare and others, I think, is working in it. Who, are like uh, advanced intellectual Marxists who did real research into, um, uh, say, uh, Honeywell and its corporate structure and its, its napalm products or napalm-like products, or Dow Chemical, or into the Rockefeller uh, empire in Latin America. So there was a, um, so they had all the little NACLA books or pre-NACLA books and. There's a whole uh, variety of literature which never got 
carried very clearly or extensively in the university book sh bookshops around Columbia or NYU, which you can find now in the little red Maoist bookshops all over Berkeley or Chicago or New York. I don't know if there's one around here. Uh, I haven't seen it. <coughs> no, is there any place that we can get that kind of political analysis literature here? Yeah, the big cities you can, and it's useful actually. I used to go around whenever I gave a poetry reading carrying with me, um, I think it was NACLA or some similar organization had put out a book on the uh, military contracts that universities had. So every time I'd hit like Illinois State or normal Illinois or uh, some little, little, little university town, I could always look up in the book and find out, well, this, this has a contract to research uh, jellied petroleum to spread on ocean waves so that sailors who were torpedoed couldn't swim it would be burned. <laughs> or this, uh, see the Battelle Institute in uh, Cleveland, I guess, had a contract to, um, well, I mean, the mathematics department had a contract to determine the arc or curve that a projectile might take if you were firing it from uh, 100 miles at sea onto a jungle, or, or if you were weighting it down with thousands of little pellets so it would bust out and defoliate an area the size of a football field, what kind of, um, whether it would be better for it to come straight down or whether it would be better to come at, at a 30 degree angle or something. Well, in other words, there was a lot of technical information that was researched by uh, radical scholars who weren't part of the establishment academic structure in the sense that they could not get government or private grants to research such matters and so had to collect money from rich, hippie, radical millionaires to finance those projects. And so there's a very vast variety of, uh, of uh, sort of semi-underground but high-class scholarly literature. So Ed Sanders carried all that in the Peaside Bookstore. But we noticed that the place kept getting busted. Uh, uh, the police kept coming in looking for grass around 1964, five, uh, chasing people, uh, uh, trying to plant heroin. There was always was some problem. We got, we got a little paranoid thinking, well, it's just the local narcs or it couldn't be a big plot against us <laughs> or it couldn't possibly be directed from Washington or um, how could we prove it anyway that, 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 it was, that we were being persecuted or that he was being persecuted? And once uh, there was a break-in into his, uh, he had that little apartment in the rear of, um, through an alleyway, had to walk through an alley on uh, Avenue A into the backyard and then into a little old stone, a brick, a brick uh, three-story cold water apartment where he had a three-room flat where he kept copies of Fuck You, a magazine of the arts, and uh, I think his set of poems called Peace Eye that City Lights published, and uh, Lee Mar newsletter, which he edited, Legalized Marijuana, because actually he started that too, that too with Michael Aldrich from Buffalo around in the early 60s. They started a Lee Mar, which was research into the law and into the history and sociology of the mar of marijuana repression. And they circulated that information with little literary essays by Burroughs or myself or Charles Olson on the subject. All, in a sense, investigative poetics, uh, making use of all, all the new uh, um, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, beatnik, zap language uh, with the uh, slogan, total assault on the culture. I guess you've heard that. The reason I'm talking about all this is um, setting up the stage. There were a break-in. There was a break-in into his house in, where, we, where he kept all this stuff. And all his magazines and uh, files and mimeograph stuff was, so, some of it was stolen, a lot of it was thrown around on the floor. And at first we thought, well, maybe it's meth heads that resented him, or maybe it was local narcs, or, but who was it? 
So it turns out, years later, this year, I went to Washington to visit a, f a lawyer friend, Ira Lowe, who was the lawyer for um, a lot of the uh, peace demonstrators in 67, during the levitation of the Pentagon uh, assembly in Washington. You've heard of that, I guess, which Sanders took part of. Was, in fact, Sanders was, performed the main ritual. Um, exorcism. Uh, with a sound truck and the fugs. And I think uh, Kenneth Anger, who, who was angry at uh, Sanders for, for uh, his political exorcism for some reason or other, I think Kenneth Anger being an S&M film diabolist thought that it was uh, the wrong tactics to, to try and uh, exercise the Pentagon. And so it was exercising Sanders from underneath the soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Sanders had also founded the Yip was one of the founders of the Yippie movement with Abby Hoffman and uh, Jerry Rubin and uh, a guy named Keith Lampy, who was the head of, one of the heads of veterans, Vietnam veterans, or veterans for peace, a veterans group, forgot which. Lampy later went, moved to the West and became Ponderosa Pine as spokesman for the uh, trees of California as, as a deeper form of um, cultural uh, readjustment than just protest against the war. Studying with Tarthang Tokel now, studying man chanting and mantra in Berkeley. Well, so Ira Lowe, who had been the lawyer for a bunch of people at the Pentagon demonstration, who I think had been the lawyer that got Mailer and all the other people out of jail during that, uh, that situation, that, uh, the siege of the Pentagon. What is it? What was his name of his book? The Siege of Miami and Mailer's book? Pardon me? Armies of the Night, yeah. Well, when Mailer was one of the members of that Army of the Night, he got busted, and Ira Lowe was his lawyer. And there was a whole group of uh, lawyers in Washington that were radicals that helped out. So I've been uh, uh, working with Ira Lowe the last few years, getting my papers under the Freedom of Information Act, my papers from the CIA, the FBI, um, the um, Drug Enforcement Agency, the Treasury Department, the Customs Department, Army Intelligence, <coughs> Navy Intelligence, um, there are about 25 agencies. If you want to get your papers, you have to really need a technical knowledge and a lawyer and many, many duplicate letters to be sent out to each one of the agencies, with plus follow-ups, plus forms filled out. So he, uh, he got my papers. Lowe was working on papers for Jane Fonda and for um, Tom Hayden. So he was getting money for that. And then, uh, then he offered <coughs> to get mine free. So I paid a couple hundred dollars for court, court costs. And he brought, got me packs of stuff within a year. <laughs> and then uh, he got Ed's papers, too. And also, um, we, uh, we were talking over, we thought it would be interesting if he would get Leroy Jones's papers. You know, and actually get the literary field covered <laughs> a little bit. So we have pa papers from Leroy Jones, from myself, from Ed. Well, all, all this preliminary stuff about Ed's apartment and uh, being busted into was background for the fact that th this year, Lowe showed me a piece of paper saying that um, uh, when, in 1964 or 5, when Ed was um, living on Avenue A, actually there was a little report from an FBI agent saying surveillance was maintained at, uh, across the street from Ed Sanders' apartment on a 24-hour basis, and uh, the subject was reported to leave at 1 p.m. and to take his car and drive it to some other place and uh, go to the grocery store and tarry, uh, uh, stay there for, for a full half hour and then walk back by foot and carrying bags of groceries, st stopping around Avenue C on the way. So actually, it wasn't paranoia. All the way from Washington, there were these filaments of, uh, uh, of electrical information <laughs> uh, uh, going down to uh, Ed, who was just a funny guy actually, like just sort of a, a, a comic writer in a way, serious, serious comic writer. 
So uh, actually, um, the government had more mimeograph machines than we did, is what it boiled down to, and more telephones and more uh, writers than we did, than the literary people did. There were more people at typewriters, more secretaries, more agents, <coughs> more activists than we did. And I think most of the activists were followed in um, their work was checked on, um, houses were robbed, or forged letters were written to screw them up. Uh, the, of Ed, the only, the only um, I haven't seen his whole file, it was just that one little thing which really astounded me because I thought he was such an innocent guy. Peace Eye Bookstore in the Lower East Side, Lemar and Fuck You, a magazine of the arts, and they actually had a whole core of trained agents following him around. So. Well, I, I haven't seen his whole file. It was just, we were, just showed me that one thing, because I was, actually, the reason I was interested was I suggested that Ira Lowe get Ed's papers, because I remembered back in the early 60s there was this break-in into his house, and that's illegal. And so that's sort of like a smoking pistol. And if that was FBI or a local Red Squad, then probably it would be in the papers. And it's so long ago that they probably wouldn't have covered it up. You know, be in his papers, be in his files, and they probably wouldn't have covered it up because the agents who did it probably moved on to some other bureau, and when the slip of paper came in to get these files, it wouldn't be anybody directly connected who would hide it. Um, I don't know what um, what was turned, and it's also outside statute of limitations, but I don't know what was turned up, actually. It was just that uh, since I told Ira Lowe, why don't you check that era, and he pulled out this paper saying, yes, it's really true, he was being covered. The government was really covering him at that time. Well, what's interesting was what was Ed's activity? It was really investigative poetics in the sense of, uh, in the dope area, he was checking the government, he was probing into the government bureaucracies and making public um, uh, informa making information to the public through the medium of poetry or some literary magazine or some uh, um, freak out zap uh, extravaganza languaged manifestos. But he was doing like, oh, his style was Dada, Dadaist, or old fashioned American pamphleteer, Tom Paine, uh, Village Crank, um, uh, Petrushevsky, circle pre-revolutionary Russian anarchist, hidden in the, with a basement mimeograph machine. <laughs> And one thing he kept noticing was that the government, or the, the um, FBI, and Nixon, and, all, and Mitchell, and uh, <clears throat> all, all the um, earlier FBI people had read all these big books about the Russian Revolution and took it very seriously when there was a group of three or four people with a mimeograph machine in their basement. Because <laughs> 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 they realized that's how revolutions actually do begin. <laughs> you know, just a couple of guys with a mimeograph machine and a funny idea, and you've got to watch them, otherwise, you know, they'll grow like a big cancer and take over after a while. So that was a paranoia of the government dealing with the uh, paranoia critical style of humor. That's a phrase of uh, Dolly, paranoia critical style of humor of the... Uh, I guess late beatnik style Sanders. So uh, I have, well the point I'm making is that the poetic probing that he did was uh, uh, sufficiently precise that it touched a nerve somewhere and so just as he was investigating the government, the government was investigating him. And uh, not only investigating but manipulating like uh, probably uh, uh, breaking into his uh, offices and uh, turning files upside down. So over the, through the 60s, he and I and various others got more and more interested in investigating the government and uh, illegal activities of the government. And that's part, one aspect of what he means by investigative poetry, I think. So what I want to do with this period is just talk about what I understand of his notion of investigative poetry and the things that we've done in common. Um, Maybe touching on some things that he'll go into in more extensive detail, but just give my angle on, on the same. So I want to begin with um, uh, a, a sample or a poem. Um, uh, this is something that I did that Ed approves of or, or encouraged, uh, that I actually got a little bit out of Ed. It's a song. Ed started the Fugs. 
a rock group which also began uh, in the 60s, in early 60s, about at the same time as Peace Eye, uh, 64, the Fugs would rehearse at the Peace Eye bookstore. And that was um, people that worked in the Holy Modal Rounders later, uh, Weber, um, Tully Kupferberg, soloist, Ed soloist, a couple other people that turned up in the uh, in other bands, that I keep seeing now in other bands, people who play with Joni Mitchell or uh, um, hang around the other end in New York, apparently he, got, he was able to get a hold of a lot of good musicians to back up the amateur poet singers of the Fugs. And I remember one of his early interesting songs was Police State. And he was taking, uh, that, he was taking that kind of uh, literary, political material and uh, investing it into pop songs and rock songs and making a total assault on the culture, making a real combine of uh, high culture and uh, um, low, uh, police low life or uh, um, dope fiend low life uh, um, hipness. So he was one of the first that um, introduced actual politics into the um, into into uh, rock music, and it actually affected a lot of the a lot of the other uh, rock musicians. Because when he was playing in uh, Greenwich Village in a little theater, I remember uh, Paul McCartney came, and um, uh, people from uh, the Stones band. Um, there were all, all other musicians who were commercially better set up, but who were really curious and interested in seeing the sophistication and intelligence and obvious high balletic quality of what uh, Sanders was doing in terms of body movements as well as language. So uh, the, then later on I got into writing pop songs. So the fruition of this is CIA Dope Calypso, which will be coming out on Columbia Records this fall. <laughs> In 1945, China was won by Mao Zedong. Chiang Kai-shek's army ran away, and they're waiting there in Thailand today. Supported by the CIA, pushing junk down Thailand way. First they stole from the Mio tribes, up in the hills they started taking bribes. Then they sent their soldiers up to Shan, collecting opium to sell to the man. Pushing junk in Bangkok today, supported by the CIA. Brought their jam on mule trains down to Chiang Rai, that's a railroad town. Sold it next to police chief Brain. He took it to town on the choo-choo train. Trafficking dope to Bangkok all day. Supported by the CIA. The policeman's name was Mr. Fowl. He peddles dope, grand scale and howl. Chief of the border, customs paid by Central Intelligence's U.S. aid. The whole operation, newspapers say, supported by the CIA. He got so sloppy and he peddled so loose. He busted himself and he cooked his own goose. Took the reward for an opium load. Seizing his own hall, which same he resold. Big time pusher, a decade turned gray. A working for the CIA. The whole operation fell into chaos. Till U.S. intelligence came into Laos. I tell you no lie, I'm a true American. Our big pusher there was Fumi Nusovan. All them princes in the power play, but Fumi was the man for the CIA. To be Lefong, he worked for the French. Big fat man liked to dine and to winch. Prince of the Mios, he grew black mud till opium flowed through the land like a flood. Communists came and chased the French away. So Toby took a job with the CIA. And his best friend, General Vang Pao, ran our Mio army like a sacred cow. Helicopter smugglers filled long chain bars in Zhang Quang province on the plain of jars. It started in C 
secret they were fighting yesterday. Congestion secret army of the CIA. All through the 60s, the dope flew free through Canton Hood, Saigon to Marshall Key. Air America followed through, transporting confiture for President Chu. All these dealers were decades yesterday, the Indo-Chinese mob of the U.S. CIA. Operation Haylift Officer William Colby saw Marshal Keith fly opium. Mr. Mustard told me Indochina desk, he was chief of dirty tricks. Hitchhiking with the pushers was how he got his fix. Subsidizing traffickers to drive the Reds away. Still Colby was the head of the whole world CIA. Subsidizing traffickers to drive the Reds away. Till Colby was the head of the whole Well, actually, that's a product of uh, our of collaboration with Ed over a long, or, you know, mutual collaboration with Ed over a long period of time, or mutual exchange of ideas and turning each other on to possibilities of uh, poetry, po poetics, as well as possibilities of investigation. I'll talk a little bit about that particular thing. Uh, that, that song is from uh, First Blues which is a book of songs I put out a couple of years ago, and is the byproduct of maybe 15 or 20 years of preoccupation with the whole dope problem and research into it related to literary matters, oddly enough, um, or inextricable from literary cultural uh, research to begin with. It all started when hanging around Times Square in the 40s, as described in Burroughs' Junkie and in my preface to it, which is around in the library, I realized that the uh, official government version of what marijuana was like and my own experience and my friend's experience was like two different universes. Because at that time, 1945, 46, you got to remember that it was really a question of, of dope fiend, and it was like really terrible, like public cocksucking or something, like something awful, you know, like uh, the, the idea of uh, grass, uh, marijuana was so in such bad repute, people, uh, the, the official propaganda was that it sent you straight to the madhouse. And I guess you, you, know, you know about that historically, don't you? I mean, there's been enough reruns of the old reefer madness movies of the 30s. Uh, so I couldn't figure out how that could be, how people could, how it could be so disjointed. And by doing just a little bit of research, I realized that there really was a conspiracy. I mean, in other words, a misunderstanding as big as that could not have come about without an enormous amount of money and effort and energy being put into a campaign of public education that would distort people's ideas. And so I began actually doing a little bit of research on it uh, in the 40s and found that one of the first big things I found was that Governor, that Mayor LaGuardia of New York had had uh, a um, report on marijuana made which said that it was all right, gave marijuana a clean bill of health on, only a, a 10 years earlier, in 1938, the same year that Congress was illegalizing it. So I realized it had been a political struggle uh, then doing further research into the whole history of the Narcotics Bureau, uh, I realized it was a case of Parkinson's Law, that a bureau, like a, a government bureaucracy like that, tends to find more and more work for itself and tries to extend its power and take over more and more territory. And then I began thinking, well, what about the junkies then? So I began researching that, and that research goes back that is that the roots of that problem go back to World War I and 1918, 1920, the Harrison Act. And you find out that before that, junkies were not considered as dope fiends, but just medical problem. And that a, um, a gang of doctors in New York State who had a private clinic who wanted to make money had legislation um, passed in New York State making it illegal for doctors to prescribe uh, heroin that it had to be done in their, li their licensed and registered clinics. So they made a lot of money on it. And it was, it was like a, 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 um, 
a group of people who, who want a little monopoly on the uh, commerce. And then there was a guy, uh, Representative Volk, who got up in, con in Congress, who denounced, denounced it as a conspiracy by a group of doctors to make money um, by getting a sort of franchise on all the heroin cures in their upstate New York rest homes. And then there was a big fight. And then um, the, the Treasury Department stepped in um, and closed down government clinics, in, uh, which are like the British system now, where you can go, if you're a junkie, go and get, or like the methadone system now, closed down all the clinics in New Orleans, cutting off, advising a cut off of federal funds, and drove all the junkies on the street, where the junkies then began robbing and stealing to get money for their fix, and that led to the idea of a junkie as a criminal, and that was reinforced by Treasury Department men going out and busting him with guns. So pretty soon, like, a circular system had been set up, and uh, then a lot of doctors protested the, the government intervention in the patient-doctor relationship. So uh, there was then a, an attack on the doctors by the Treasury Department, and something like 20,000 doctors were busted for trying to do regular medical treatment for junkies. And um, a number, an enormous amount paid fines, and about 3,000 went to jail. Yeah? What was the Harrison Act? Pardon me? What was the Harrison Act? The Harrison Act was a 1918, 1920, I think. That was the original law that forbid. Well, that began regulating junkies, junk, re began regulating the sale of heroin and opiates. Also booze? Uh, no. It, it, w it was of that time, though, of the time of prohibition, of that same nature. I think the provisions were, some sort of technical provision that a doctor had to be licensed to prescribe for addiction. Not just regular medical license, but a, a special license beyond that. You had to have a license from the Treasury Department, the, a, uh, uh, an opiate license from the Treasury Department. So the Treasury Department took over the licensing of the medical profession in this area. <laughs> uh, really weird, actually. Remember, t see, the, I mean, think of how weird it is anyway that the Treasury Department should have control of drugs you know, you take it for granted, but when you think historically, how did that ever happen? Well, it goes back to this situation. The um, Anslinger I th was the head of the Treasury Department um, Narcotics Control Board, and I think he had originally worked in prohibition in the alcohol control. Actually, I've forgotten half of all of this. Alan, who's yeah. supplying the dope in those days? Oh, it was uh, up to 1918. It was a regular commercial thing. You could get uh, snake oil remedies or in uh, drugstores, uh, laudanum, paragoric, opiate tincture of opium you could buy. There were a number of junkies, illegal junkies, old ladies or young who would have their laudanum every day, and maybe 100,000 or a half million, just like now. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Except there was no fuss about it. It was just sort of like Aunt Minnie is going upstairs to take her laudanum and she'll retire for the evening, but she'll be down tomorrow morning and cook breakfast. <laughs> you can get the history of all this in a, a, a couple of really good books. Um, see, America's Drug Hang-Up, 50 Years of Folly, written by Rufus King. Um, who was former chairman of the American Bar Association, American Medical Association Joint Committee on Narcotics Policy. A uh, very intelligent guy, and that's the best uh, historical survey of the uh, uh, buildup of the narcotics bureaucracy and of narcotics politics. America's drug hang-up, 50 years of folly, Rufus King. And another good book is um, The Addict and the Law by Alfred R. Lindesmith, uh, Indiana University Press. 
Those are the early pioneers in all this research. There's lots of other books now, but I haven't kept up with the literature. They were the early breakthrough books, actually. And I guess Lester Greenspoon's book on marijuana probably has some of the early history. Well, all this uh, is uh, simply to say that um, there was some kind of vast and large-scale weird conspiracy to um, interfere with people's lives, <laughs> to, to interfere with the doctor-patient relationship, to, to tell niggers to stop smoking grass or tell white people to stop imitating the niggers smoking grass. For whatever reason, uh, it entered into the poetry world because there's this old tradition of Théophile Gautier and the Club of Hashishin, the Hashishin's Club, or Arthur Rimbaud and Paul Verlaine, French poets of the 1870s, uh, taking hashish, Baudelaire's writings on hashish, Coleridge on writing um, Kublai Khan on, in an opium dream, Thomas de Quincey's Confessions of an Opium Eater. There, um, um, uh, anti uh, 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 antique uh, Vedas written about Soma, um, all sorts of Aboriginal literature, as well as anthropological literature, as well as Yellow Decades 1890 literature by Havelock Ellis, or Edward Carpenter, or William James, dealing with anesthetic revelations. So, uh, drug uh, dilettantism has always been some little element of literary history, and the most romantic and interesting parts the French decadent writers in the uh, 1840s f uh, uh, French literary society with uh, Gautier and uh, Delacroix and Baudelaire and real high-minded people, all of a sudden you have these, if you're a poet in 1940s, 50s America, you have all these real interesting poets and their backgrounds, but you find there's this huge police, police condition in this area, and so naturally you want to find out what those poets were into. So almost every poet in the 40s and 50s, who, particularly those who were influenced by Rambeau, which is like 100% really, from, from uh, Jack Kerouac to Patti Smith, they all wanted to know what kind of hashish Rambeau was taking, naturally, <laughs> wouldn't you, as Burroughs said, or what it was like to take opium, or just the natural inquisitiveness and curiosity of poet or of writer or of just a, of a vision seeker or, or a smart kid or, uh, or, or old bohemian or uh, elegant faggot or uh, strong-minded macho Hemingway who would also want to know what kind of opium was being used by the bullfighters if they were using it. <laughs> I mean, it's just, na na just natu natural that you'd want to know what was going on behind the scenes. And yet here was this enormous police condition in this area that was unnatural, especially if you read history and so that they actually, 1840, uh, Théophile Gautier and Baudelaire and other people belonged to a club where they'd meet every week and take hashish and write poems or something. Like, what's going on now? You can't do that? You got to go to jail? So obviously, then, then you scratch the surface and you see the LaGuardia report which says there's nothing wrong with marijuana. Then you go down to Times Square and you see all these big hoodlum looking cops busting people for smoking grass or carrying it or trying to sell it. And you realize there's something really weird going on. And then you see all the junkies shuddering down the street and with their noses dripping and stealing your overcoat and <laughs> wonder what led to that condition and why the police are so mad at them when they should be sending them to a doctor. And then you begin realizing that uh, the plainclothes detectives are actually selling <laughs> heroin, uh, and um, that, um, the intel that if you do a little more research, you realize that the head of the Narcotics Bureau's intelligence agency, or the Special Investigative Squad, has actually got a working relationship with organized crime and the mafia. And then you do a little bit of more work, and you, re and you realize historically, if you look up newspaper clippings, that Every decade, they bust the entire Narcotics Bureau for peddling. And then you do a little more research, and um, 
Say you're involved in the war and anti-war activity in Vietnam, and you hear rumors that Air America is transporting heroin, uh, transporting opium, for the CIA. And then you get all involved with, with re further research, and then as you go into it deeper and deeper, you see that <clears throat> somehow or other there's a working relationship between the mafia, organized crime, and the dope bureaucracies and the secret police intelligence bureaucracies, and it's all mixed into one. Pottage, and so you have somebody like Ed Sanders from the other side who's got the Lemar newsletter and Total Assault on the Culture and League for Sexual Freedom and Fuck You Magazine of the Arts and Junkies Liberation Movement uh, and uh, Fugs Singing Police State. And um, it all so, sort of becomes one large paranoid system. <laughs> a big paranoiac projection. Got that on tape? The whole study <laughs> finally <laughs> leads you to the conclusion that it's just a big paranoiac projection and that maybe you're crazy, or maybe they're crazy, or maybe you're all crazy together. <laughs> then you begin getting angry and paranoid. Maybe they're following you. And uh, who did they kill last time? And whose house are they breaking into now? So it's a dangerous field to get into unless you have something to balance and stabilize your mind, which is why uh, it's very useful to have this sort of subject taught surrounded by Zen masters and Tibetan lamas. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, where, where, there, where there's the where's where, where recourse to emptiness in the middle of it all, where you can always have recourse to meditation to calm your anxieties and to, to, to empty the paranoia out so that the, the paranoia becomes another playful toy or poetic fancy rather than something that you really have to get worried about and hide in a basement, basement like the Invisible Man. So, uh, so the, as Ed will point out, the danger of investigative poetics is uh, that your natural paranoia will take over and then uh, underneath that, the, the cause of that is actually just anger, really, or aggression. Uh, Maybe sort of fixated ideas on your own ego identity and your own goodness and the badness of other people and that you're good and other people are evil and that the evil people are taking over the good people. And if only you are strong enough and keep, keep track of all the evil people, you can take them up to the New York Times Supreme Court and get them all busted through the Washington Post and, <laughs> and uh, clear up all, and all the sins will be cleared up and everything will come back to normal, which is what Ezra Pound was into, except he thought it was all the banking system that was suggested, I was saying, it's all the drug system. So Pound thought it was a banking system. Uh, in the Cantos, he's got an analysis of uh, money. And his um, point is that as money is used as a commodity, rather than merely some measure of exchange, but as money is used to make money, like the bank loans out money at a high rate of interest to get more money, that this abuse of the medium of exchange is what poisons the entire economy. When money is loaned out not for productive, for, for, to encourage socially useful production, but is loaned out to make more money for the loaner or the bank, then some natural unbalance is, is entered right into the uh, bloodstream, so to speak, or the, 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 the most delicate part of the nervous system of social communication, the, the, uh, the uh, symbol of exchange, the money. So Pound went into giant research into the history of banks, back to Medici banks and back to Roman banks and communal banks where there was no question of getting money for money. It was just sort of a very small rate of interest and money was loaned out for only for useful production and uh, came up with a, an entire analysis of, analysis of the entire society based on money, which became his obsession for, till he was 80, uh, till, he, till he got um, so close to death he realized that, um, well, it wasn't really money, it was greed. <laughs> <laughs> so he should have been working on people's minds and psychology rather than the externalized <coughs> banking system because that was just a manifestation of greed. Um, and so he felt that his whole life and all his work, Pound finally felt all his life and work was a mess. Uh, stupidity and ignorance all the way through. Himself, at the age of 80, 
So I was just pointing out some of the dangers of investigative poetics. Um, for, uh, for, for my own obsession with dope police state, the dope police, I've uh, sort of concluded research on that in about 1971 and presented a paper at the Institute for Policy Research in Washington, which is published in a book called Allen Verbatim with myriad footnotes and references. And it, sort of, it was a climax of my obsession or preoccupation with that subject, and I sort of got out of it since then, having sort of laid it down on paper. But uh, it forms the basis for a number of references and songs and poems um, that, uh, that I published as poems rather than as prose. And I'd rather not go on and on more with it now. I just sort of started going into it, and I got, found myself going back into the same compulsive rap <laughs> going back to 1918, which you have to finally pull all the different parts of your knowledge and all the historical references together and can go on for days and days and days. And any one of you who's been involved with somebody obsessed with the assassination committees or whether Kennedy was killed by Sirhan or Oswald or Ruby or Santo Traficante, or you've heard it all, I guess, haven't you? So I'll read a poem on that subject next. Um, in which, uh, finally, I try to get it all together, but in a poetic form. So the, the whole point of investigative poetics, I guess, is how do you take all that material, like Pound's obsessive accumulation of data on Roman banking systems and long, boring accounts of Chinese production and equity and uh, Renaissance banks, how do you find a way of putting it in a, uh, putting it concisely on the page so that people don't get bored and start saying like, like you know, the, walking around with an albatross of this idea around your neck? How do you uh, present? Or I think uh, Sanders's phrase is, "How do you present data clusters? How do you deal with how do you, how do you dress up or present or data clusters in a way that the information that you think is crucial will get across to the intellectual reader, but also to the general public, and at the same time, be pretty, <laughs> and at the same time, last a thousand years, so it's, like, it's not boring. <laughs> See, so it's not boring, so it's still good, you know, like, um, still got some kind of poetry in it. How do you make poetry out of all these facts? And as the, as the world gets bigger and more complicated and bureaucratized and socialized or communized or capitalized or CIAized, then it gets more, uh, and to the extent that a poet does deal with history, it gets more important as time goes on to actually to be a master of facts and to be involved in such matters. But at the same time, it gets more and more unimportant because it's more and more boring and more and more detailed and routine and, and uh, obsessional. And anybody can do it, and it's the daily newspaper, and if you get really into it, you're cutting up all the daily newspaper and keeping clipping <laughs> services that refer to everything and interconnect, and you know it can be done better by IBM, but who's going to program <laughs> But who's going to program the IBM to take care of it and find the results you're looking for, which is that the CIA killed Kennedy because they were connected with the Cuban heroin pushers who are now living in Tampa and were also dealing dope out of Saigon. Well, you have to comp You'd have to get a computer programmer who would search out all the files and get it, get, get all that data together. Well, anyway, here's my, um, I'll start with a, um, this poem is called How to Be Playing on the Jukebox, dealing with what do you do with data clusters, May 30th, 1975, 3 a.m. I was up late at night worried about this whole problem, 3 a.m. <laughs> 75. How to be playing on the jukebox? How to be flashing like the Daily Double? How to be playing on TV? How to be loudmouthed on the comedy hour? How to be announced over loudspeakers? How to be said in old ladies' language? CIA and mafia are in cahoots. How to be said in old ladies' language? How to be said in American headlines? I guess I started that way because uh, I had an old lady friend, 80 years old, that I visited down around the Lower East Side. It was a family friend was living by herself, and she was an old, ra uh, old radical red communist from the 20s and 30s. She knew my mother. And uh, I went to her to show her how smart I was and said, well, you know, those uh, 
was, the, the dope isn't so bad. And she said, well, all these young people always smoking marijuana, they should be having revolutions. And I said, well, dope isn't so bad, at least a revolution. And besides, don't you realize that the CIA and the FBI and blah, blah, blah are all against the dope smokers and they think the dope smokers are all communists? And she said, yeah, well, uh, the, the, um, the, the mafia and the CIA are in cahoots anyway. You all know, everybody knows that. And I like that in cahoots, because I realized she had found the, that was the right word in old ladies' language, like Americanese. So I was always saying mafia and CIA are, are, have a working relationship, but this, <laughs> it's not quite, it's, you know, it's, too, it's sort of like for the New York Times, but it wouldn't do it on a jukebox or it wouldn't convince an old lady in Peoria. So but when she said in cahoots, I realized I had the poem, or I had some, you know, there was finally the verbal key that would unlock the riddle. So this is relating to how do you deal with all this material in the right language, or how do you present it on the page. How to be announced over loudspeakers. CIA and mafia are in cahoots. How to be said in old ladies' language. How to be said in American headlines. Kennedy stretched and smiled and got double-crossed by low-life goons and agents. Rich bankers with criminal connections. Dope pushers in CIA working with dope pushers from Cuba, working with big time syndicate Tampa, Florida. Had to be said with big mouth. Uh, I want a footnote here. This being 1975. March 17, 1977. The guy I had in mind was a guy named Santos Traficante, who lives in Tampa, Florida, working with big time syndicate Tampa, Florida. Traficante was interesting to me because in the um, research I did on CIA involvement with Indochina, it turns out that Traficante, who had been a big head of narcotics uh, trafficking in Cuba, had been kicked out by Castro with the rest of the prostitution, gambling, and narcotics people, was in Saigon in 1968 at the Caravelle Hotel for a big conference to divide up the opium traffic. And he was like a known uh, no, uh, uh, narcotics pusher. So how did he ever get into Saigon without this, you know, uh, uh, un under US control? What was he doing at the biggest hotel in Saigon at a big conference reported publicly? And how could he get away with this unless the CIA were somehow involved or had some complicity or there was some uh, relationship? Because I remember, uh, there were lots of newsmen who couldn't get into Saigon, and people were always being plucked out of Saigon and those who were protesting the war. So how could a big-time gangster dope pusher be in Saigon? And it, it, it actually, the, the information about him being in Saigon came from Colonel Lucien Conin, who was a big CIA agent in um, Saigon from 61 on, and who knew all the, the Italian dope connections and who knew all the local dope connections and was part of, uh, uh, familiar with the old French intelligence agency which used to support itself by sale of heroin. So that in, in Conin and the CIA knew that Santos Traficante was there, so what was going on? Anyway, so it struck me, so I wrote big time. Dope pushers in CIA working with dope pushers from Cuba, working with big time syndicate Tampa, Florida. That's uh, six, seven, it's 1975. March 17, 1977, AP, Washington, Santos Traficante, sole survivor of three U.S. underworld figures who plotted with the CIA against Fidel Castro, declined to answer any questions Wednesday from the House Committee on Assassinations, including whether he discussed plans to murder President John F. Kennedy. Quote, did you ever discuss with any individual plans to assassinate President Kennedy prior to his assassination? Chief Counsel Richard A. Sprague asked. Traficante, a former gambling figure in Cuba, refused to answer that and the 13 other questions put to him, evoking constitutional provisions including the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Traficante refused to say if Jack Ruby, the man who killed Lee Harvey Oswald, had once visited him when he was in prison in Havana, Cuba, and refused to say if he was involved in CIA assassination plots against Castro or whether any federal agency had tried to keep him from testifying before the House Committee. Traffic County was one of three underworld figures involved in the CIA assassination plots against Castro. The other two, John Rosselli and Sam Giancana, were murdered after the Senate Intelligence Committee sought their testimony two years ago. 
Rosselli was assassinated after testifying and Jan Kana was killed right before he was scheduled to testify. Sprague also asked traffic county years if he had ever met with CIA representatives to discuss assassination of world leaders, including Fidel Castro. It is said, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee said two years ago that Rosselli, Giancana, and Traficante were recruited by the CIA to have Castro assassinated. It is said Traficante lined up an assassin in one of the plots to put poison in Castro's food at a Havana restaurant. So it was just interesting to get it all locked in in one figure, to get all my paranoia rolled into one knot. Well, rich bankers with criminal connections, dope pushers and CIA working with dope pushers from Cuba, working with dope big time syndicate Tampa, Florida, had to be said with big mouth, had to be moaned over factory foghorns, had to be chattered on car radio news broadcast, had to be screamed in the kitchen, had to be yelled in the basement where uncles were fighting, had to be howled on the streets by newsboys to bus conductors, had to be foghorned into New York Harbor, had to echo under hard hats, had to turn up the volume in university ballrooms, had to be written in library books, footnoted, had to be in headlines of the Times and Le Monde, had to be barked over TV, had to be heard in side alleys through bar room doors, had to be playing on wire services, had to be bells ringing, comedians stopped dead in the middle of a joke in Las Vegas, had to be FBI Chief J.E. Hoover and Frank Costello, syndicate mouthpiece, meeting in Central Park together weekends in New York, reported posthumously Time magazine, had to be mafia and CIA together started war on Cuba, Bay of Pigs and poison assassination headlines, had to be the dope cops and the mafia sold all that heroin in America, had to be FBI and organized crime working together in cahoots against the commies who let Lucky Luciano out of jail take over Sicily Mediterranean drug trade, had to be Corsican goons in office strategic services pay, busted 1948 dock strikes in Marseille, 60s port transshipment Indochina heroin, had to be ringing on multinational cash registers, worldwide laundry for organized criminal money, had to be CIA and mafia and FBI together bigger than Nixon, bigger than the war, had to be a gorged throat full of murder, had to be mouth and ass, a solid mass of rage, a red hot head, a scream in the back of the throat, had to be in Kissinger's brain. Had to be in Rockefeller's mouth. Had to be Central Intelligence, the family, our thing, the agency, mafia, organized crime, FBI, dope cops, and multinational corporations. One big set of criminal gangs working together in cahoots, hitmen, murderers everywhere, outraged, on the make, secret, drunk, brutal, dirty, rich, on top of a slag heap of prisons, industrial cancer, plutonium, smog, garbaged cities, grandmas, bed sores, fathers' resentments, had to be the rulers wanted law and order they got rich on, wanted protection status quo, wanted junkies, wanted Attica, wanted Kent State, wanted war in Indochina, had to be CIA and mafia and FBI, the multinational capitalist strong arm squads, private detective agencies for the very rich and their armies, navies, and air force bombing planes, how to be capitalism, the vortex of this rage, this competition man to man, horses' heads in the capos' beds, turf and rumbles, hitmen, gang wars across oceans, Cambodia bombing to settle score when Soviet pilots manned Egyptian fighter planes, Chile's red democracy bumped off with White House pots and pans, a warning to Mediterranean governments, secret police embraced for decades, NKVD and CIA keep each other's secrets. OGPU and DIA never hit their own. KGB and FBI, one mind. Brute force, worldwide and full of money. Had to be rich, had to be powerful, had to hire technology from Harvard. Had to murder in Indonesia, half million. Had a murder in Indochina, two million. Had a murder in Czechoslovakia. Had a murder in Chile. Had a murder in Russia. Had a murder in America. Well, that was sort of like a summary of all of my um, research and paranoia in one uh, sort of spurt with the, the problem of getting the right language, like had a, had a, had a, H-A-D-D-A, had to be flashing on the daily, like the daily double. And, and it was, had to get through somehow to the Dick Tracy comic strip. 
to make it, to, because the Dick Tracy comic strip is just sort of like the reverse, sort of controlled by the FBI. So how do you get it through in such clear language that it becomes sloganesque and people can remember? How do you put all the data together? Because there's a, a good deal of data in there. I mean, this business of Traficante in Tampa, Florida, uh, or um, FBI Chief J. E. Hoover and Frank Costello's syndicate mouthpiece meeting in Central Park together weekends in New York reported posthumously Time magazine. It's one line. You know. So how do you get it pretty? How do you make it pretty? Or how did be Corsican goons in office strategic services pay busted 1948 dock strikes in Marseille's 60s port transshipment into China heroin? You know, to get all the, my own associations in uh, combinations and uh, together, how do you do it in a line that's pretty enough that, that's not so pretty, that one. Um, the one I liked was gang wars across oceans, Cambodia bombed, to settle score when Cambodia bombing to settle Cambodia bombed to settle score when Soviet pilots manned Egyptian fighter planes. Now that's actually a, a surrealist line. I mean, it's pure surrealism. Cambodia bombed to settle score when Soviet pilots manned Egyptian fighter planes. Uh, I don't know what it sounds like to anyone now. You know whether it makes sense. But someone reading carefully has some political savvy will say, "Well, that's an odd statement to make. I wonder what authority there is to say that." And the authority actually is Ellsberg quoting Kissinger in 1970. Ellsberg said Kissinger told him that he bombed Cambodia as a warning to the Russians because the Russians had sent fighter pilots to man their Soviet-built planes, which is against the ground rules of their turf. <laughs> they had their turf, and they were having a rumble. And this was like you go hit the man across, the, across town. Chile's red democracy bumped off with White House pots and pans a warning to Mediterranean governments. Uh, the, uh, Kissinger said the reason they had gone in on Chile was a warning to the Italian Communist Party not to try and get take part in the government. But they didn't want it to happen in Europe. Yeah. Is that, is that mostly, uh, newspaper or? Th those two pieces of information I got directly from Ellsberg in conversation. Uh, uh, he describing information or discussions he'd had with Kissinger back in 70 before he quit. The, the thing on Chile? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the the strategy behind knocking off the Chilean government, aside from general anti-communism, aside from fear of communist takeover in South America, was that well, the Chileans got elected. The Reds got elected in Chile, and there were going to be elections in Greater Portugal and in uh, Italy and in France. And uh, it looked like it does look like the communist sooner or later will get elected, at least enough to take part in the government. And the crucial matter will be when they get elected with sufficient power to take part in the security departments, that is to say, the secret police, the intelligence departments, the nerve center. Well, that's where that's where all the crux is, actually. Are they going to have you know like if they take part in the government, will they get the police or not? Because whoever gets the police and the secret police and the intelligence, they got the ball game, which was actually the secret of uh, the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, that the liberals in the Czech government had apparently uh, gotten so much power that the next day they were going to take the, over the offices of the interior ministry, the secret police, where the files were that uh, showed that the secret police till that time had been controlled by the Moscow secret police and that all the killings and assassinations and jailings from the late 40s on in Czechoslovakia were ordered from Moscow, which would have been a major scandal, which would have rocked the whole communist world if the, that had come out. There would have been like a big Watergate there. So the tanks rolled in to prevent the... That information I got from a guy named Joseph Skvaretsky who was like a great novelist who had to flee in 68. And his friends told him that was the crucial point. So it's the crucial point in all this, in a way, in investigative poetics is intelligence. It's sort of like the poets and their intelligence versus the secret police and their intelligence. And who's writing the better poem? Or who's, <laughs> or who's writing the more, more, <laughs> the more exquisite prose or the more um, interesting um, 
strategy, total assault on the culture. But So now I'd like to move on to some samples of prose by the intelligence agencies. Uh, these are documents under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, uh, as background to this, I should also say that in 1970, 1960, 60 or 62, I don't, I don't know what the proper citation is, J. Edgar Hoover got up in, um, at a, I think the Republican convention and said that the three biggest threats to America were the communists, the beatniks, and the eggheads. The Actually he said that the eggheads. Who were the eggheads? Well, L.A. Stevenson. The, the eggheads were sort of uh, <laughs> faggot proto-communists, I guess. You know, intellectuals who didn't do any work and fancy pants. Eggheads. <laughs> uh, a fancy pants was a fancy pants intellectuals was Joseph McCarthy's phrase for people who weren't macho enough to want a big army and fight the communists or something. Anyway, so they're always then uh, Hoover. Apparently, as early as '65, there was this Operation COINTEL, COINTEL Pro counterintelligence program, aimed at many many different groups. I think it probably, I don't have much on it, but I think it probably included the beatniks as a formal organized counterintelligence matter. I don't have any papers on it, but um, I, sooner or later I think there'll be enough research, or research will show that um, the FBI or the federal police, the FBI probably collected as much scandalous information as they could from local newspapers or local police things like uh, bearded hippie, uh, stabs grandmother in Iowa farmhouse or whatever and uh, took as many of those stories as they could and uh, made sure they were circulated all over the United States to give an image of bearded, unwashed, bed bug ridden, hairy, murderous beatniks. Uh, I think that was actually literally organized um, but I don't have any papers on that to prove it but there were on many other groups, vast organizations, uh, more overtly political people, like uh, uh, Hoover was involved in uh, making sure that the charisma of many uh, black writers and organizers and spokesmen were was uh, stained. So he went on a, a giant campaign against uh, Leroy Jones, Stokely Carmichael, Martin Luther King, Eldridge Cleaver, and anybody that, any artist or anybody that got mixed up with them. So here are some papers on, uh, to begin with, on Leroy Jones. This is 1970. The program could maybe reached its climax in, under, at 70. FBI date 11-13-70 via Airtel to the director of FBI 144-8006 from SAC Newark. I don't know what the st strategic command in Newark or <laughs> strategic air command. No, it's SAC is a local, local FBI office in Newark. Subject, COINTEL Pro, black extremist, RM. The following counterintelligence proposal is submitted for consideration. It is recommended that a letter be sent with a Jersey City, New Jersey postmark to Leroy Jones at 502 High Street, Newark, New, Jer New Jersey, and the Newark, New Jersey newspapers. Consideration might be also given to wider distribution. It should be signed, Ministry of Information, Black Panther Party, Jersey City, New Jersey. The letter should read similarly to the following. Leroy Jones, the poet who calls himself Amiri Baraka, is Tom Pig pretending to be a true black revolutionary. He asked people not to buy the Black Panther newspaper because he wanted the people's money for himself. Jones uses the people's liberation sole power to line his pockets. His heavies threaten Panthers selling papers and people trying to buy them. Now Jones tries to put himself on a throne, like maybe you saw his picture. He fancies himself the reason Ken Gibson got elected mayor of Newark. Jones has visions of his throne in Newark, then the whole country, then the world. Jones is shoving his Congress of African people idea down the throats of brothers and sisters on High Street. He hustles them as religion to make them his slaves. He thinks he's black Jesus and he should be put on his own cross. Even Africans left at Baraka's homemade dashikis in New York. When will the black people of Newark wake up and see Jones Baraka is just playing his king role and they're his pawns? Unquote. In connection with the above suggested letter, a copy should be sent with a return address of 502 High Street, Newark, New Jersey, to, then it's eliminated, um, uh, blacked out, one line blacked out. 
though through though the papers, or even if the papers will not print a letter, as if it were smuggled out of Newark by a loyal CAP member within Jones's organization who agrees with this letter. It is pointed out that the conflict between the Black Panther Party and Jones has risen and fallen over a period of years. This letter attempts to take advantage of the currently renewed conflict engendered by Jones's anti-Black Panther propaganda to both belittle Jones and to expose the Panther's resentment of Jones. Then, from SAC to Newark, let's see, yeah. Yeah, then, no, the answer. To S.A. Sue Newark from Director FBI, November 19, 1970, COINTELPRO Black Extremist Racial Matters. Your counterintelligence proposal regarding Leroy Jones and the Black Panther Party is approved. Ensure that the letter sent cannot be traced to the Bureau. Advise the Bureau of all positive results from this proposal. Copy to San Francisco. And note, and on these replies, generally, uh, Hoover's office gives an analysis. Leroy Jones, the black extremist poet and playwright who helped elect Kenneth Gibson, the black mayor of New Jersey, has been in conflict with the black extremist Black Panther Party for some time. Jones has been known as the black messiah of the Pan-African movement in the United States. Newark has proposed a letter to Jones side Ministry of Information, Black Panther Party, Jersey City, New Jersey, attacking Jones as an Uncle Tom who's using the black people of Newark for his own purpose. Copies of the letter will also be sent to Newark newspapers and a letter to the chairman of the Congress of African People in which Jones is now active in a leadership role. This proposal will cause disruption not only within Jones's group but also in the Black Panther Party since Jones has an appreciable following in New Jersey who will resent this statement. Then from, uh, from Newark to Washington, attached for the file is a Xerox copy of the approved letter sent out on this date to the Newark Evening News and the Newark Star Ledger, Star Ledger Newark, New Jersey, and to Leroy Jones, 502 High Street, and to the Hudson Dispatch, Jersey City, Union City. And then the, the letter read finally, uh, well, more or less as I read it. Uh, Leroy Jones, the poet who calls himself Amiri Baraka, is Tom Pig pretending, comma, to be a true black revolutionary, period. He asked people not to buy the Black Panthers newspaper because, comma, he wanted real good prose. I mean, it was right from the street. <laughs> he, wants, he wants the people's money for himself, comma. Jones used the people's money for a liberation so power to line his pockets, period. His goons threat, threatened, T-R-T-H-R-E-T-A-N, his goons threaten Panthers selling papers and people, papers, comma, and people, comma, trying to buy them, B-Y, spelled by, by them, B-Y. Now Jones trying to put himself on a throne, like maybe you saw his picture. He fancies himself the reason Ken Gibson got elected mayor of Newark. Jones had visions of ruling Newark, then the whole country, then the world, and so forth. Same thing. So that was all sent out and done. Now what's interesting about that, plot within plot, because, uh, Jones was a very interesting figure and a great figure because he was in the literary world, maybe the precursor of Ed Sanders in, in terms of literary activity, uh, mimeograph, uh, homemade cultural newspaper uh, and magazine publication. In 58, 59, Jones had a magazine called Ugin and was hanging around with um, Kerouac and Corso and Peter Orlovsky and myself and Frank O'Hara and Kenneth Koch at the Cedar Bar in New York and was the one central figure uh, uniting all the different schools of poetry in one magazine, more effectively than Evergreen Review or the Chicago Review, which, which were also doing that. Plus, Jones was uniting all of us with the black groups, uh, with the black musicians like Albert Ehler and um, Don Cherry and um, I think Elvin Jones was around there. And, uh, but he would have parties where Don Cherry and Ornette Coleman and um, Cecil Terror would play. And it would be mixed with all the painters like de Kooning and Franz Klein and uh, Kerouac and uh, Corso and myself and A.B. Spellman and a whole bunch of black writers plus O'Hara plus people from Partisan Review. So it was, he had the greatest salon in Newark, and it was like an era of good feeling and a fantastically well organized social scene, resulting in uh, cultural activity that, that, really that really was powerful. 
and because uh, it was an unbeatable combination, all those people. Uh, when Malcolm X got killed, apparently Malcolm X had told Jones that he would have to take over, in case anything happened to him, Malcolm X himself had told Jones that he would take, have to take over a certain spiritual or cultural leadership. And Jones, at that time, was, you know, a funny guy, uh, literary, you know, grabbing Peter's cock at parties and, you know, smoking a lot of grass and even shooting a little junk and lots of cocaine and writing poems and seeing himself as somewhat beat, a beat poet, but an aesthetic person and also a student uh, visiting Mura Roshi, who was a Zen master in New York that uh, Gary Snyder had worked with and trained in English. So Jones was right in the middle of all that, and then all of a sudden there was this traumatic assassination of Malcolm X, plus threats of assassination of Jones. So Jones got completely paranoid and moved away from, uh, from the, the, uh, the white community and began getting scared of them. Then the FBI ma made all sorts of similar poison pen letters so that Jones was separated out from the radical group of, uh, I think it was Tom Hayden who was organizing with SDS in Newark. So that Jones denounced Tom Hayden and further isolated himself. Then Jones got into involvement with a, with a black nationalist theoretician, Ron Karenga, in, uh, at UCLA. Uh, has anybody heard of him? The U.S. group, it's called. Ron Karenga, the U.S. group, UCLA, who were also in a fight with the Panthers. In fact, several people got murdered, Panthers got murdered at UCLA by Ron Karenga's U.S. group. Karenga's view, unlike the Panthers and unlike Jones's previous view, was that the blacks would have to make it themselves without any white help, that black and white cultural mixture was a mistake, that the blacks had to find their own macho or their own balls, that white leadership would always betray them, by a white hunky liberal leadership was a, was, would soften the scene, that it was really Power grows out of the barrel of a gun. You couldn't have the barrel of a gun unless you had a unified community. You wouldn't have a unified community unless it was a community of the really oppressed. The only really oppressed people were the blacks. The blacks should identify with themselves and not with the white liberal middle class hippie revolutionary or white communists. And the blacks should identify with African culture and there should be total separation. Leroy Jones should not talk to Allen Ginsberg. Everything should get really paranoid. Well. So from 1965 to 1970, Jones was getting intellectual advisement and ideas of very brilliant nature like this from Ron Karenga. Then in uh, December last year, I went to Hollywood to do some um, a Buddhist work and played uh, at the, uh, did a show at a nightclub called the uh, Troubadour and uh, ran into Ronnie Blakely, a singer who was a star of Nashville, who I uh, spent time with on the Rolling Thunder Review. And she said, which surprised me, that she had been a big radical all during the 60s and had hung around with weathermen and people from the SDS. And it turned out that her boyfriend, who had been uh, fucking her all through the 60s in the SDS, had later turned out to be an agent. And then after he was unmasked as an agent, he kept calling her up, wanting to have no more dates. <laughs> so she, being very intelligent, said, well, where is his head anyway? <laughs> she said, yes, I'll go out and find out. So he took her out to a party full of FBI agents, and who was there but Ron Karenga? So I said, what? <laughs> so then I, then, um, then I saw uh, Roy in uh, January in New York. Uh, he had meanwhile changed his view and had become a Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist, Maoist. Uh, uh, it was the idea that he was wrong in the 60s that actually we, the white and black oppressed had to work together, that the problem was capitalism, not race, or that greed of capitalism was not necessarily a racial matter but was a pro an economic problem. So it was a Marxist interpretation. So he was now willing to work with everybody. Uh, and I told him and his wife that story about Ronnie Blakely, and he said, yeah, they had some suspicions about that. And his wife said that long ago they'd broken with Karenga, thinking that there was something funny about him, he might be an agent. Uh, though she said that for five years they were basically 
working with him and getting ideas and information and um, uh, direction, intellectual direction and social direction from Karenga. Then I saw in an underground newspaper a little item from J. Edgar Hoover, like one of these pages, saying, um, uh, use the U.S. group and Ron Karenga as a, as a group to split black from black, black group from black group, fight, play, Panthers, from, Panthers from Jones and Panthers from the U.S. movement. Um, so apparently the, 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 that group was specific, that was, so to speak, influencing Jones, who was like a giant intellectual and poetic and spiritual and cultural leader, he was being influenced by Karenga, who was being manipulated by the FBI. And then the, whether or not he was an actual agent is unsure, because I then went to Les Witten, who works with Jack Anderson, to see if he had any information. And his information was that Karenga was just a clown publicity hound who would do anything and would probably work with the FBI, but was not a paid agent. So what's the upshot? The upshot is that the entire cultural history of the 60s would have to be rewritten because one of the major events of the 60s was the black-white paranoia, the split of the whole movement, which apparently was engineered by the government. <laughs> See, now, all the radical radicals on the left were saying, uh, right on, bro, uh, the, these blacks are absolutely right, you know, they're, they're, it was, that, I guess, a white liberal guilt that made people feel that it was in, not realize the insensitivity and inhumanity of separating white from black or separating brother from brother or the tearfulness of not being able to relate to Leroy Jones after a while on a literary, if not a social, scene. So that um, it, it, uh, investigative poetics, I think, at this point, would have to go into the whole cultural and social and poetic and artistic history of the 60s, which was quite a vast, traumatic, revolutionary time, and reinvestigate a great many things that happened of an intellectual, symbolic nature to find out what was the story behind it. Because a great deal more of it was manipulated than uh, we realize. And one of the major things that was manipulated was the split between the psychedelic movement and the political. Uh, that is between Leary, say, and um, Cleaver, among other things. Uh, and that was done according to Leary and according to Cleaver, though I haven't yet seen the papers on it, but I heard both from, I've heard from Leary and I've seen it in underground papers. And I understand there was a story in Rolling Stone in October 76 to the effect that when Leary escaped, was helped by the weatherman to escape from Vacaville prison in California, or wherever he was, on his 20-year sentence for possession of a joint, uh, he was then sent off to Algiers to take, put, take uh, refuge with Eldridge Cleaver. Now, do you, any of you remember that? That Leary went to Algiers after he escaped. Went, does anybody not remember that? Here, and it's all right if you don't, because it's all ten years ago now, practically mm -hmm. seven years, and you were twelve years old, half of you. <laughs> so, and then do you remember that Cleaver arrested Leary and put him under house arrest? Is right. there anybody that doesn't remember that? There was a conflict there. And Cleaver took Leary and put him in house arrest and said Leary was too loud mouthed and he was talking with FBI agents in the cafes of Algeria and he wasn't, he was too frivolous and uh, like if he was going to be part of it, you better see it. If he was going to be part of the world revolution, you better hear the clang of iron. And uh, then everybody was shocked because what it meant was, well, fuck Leary and Eldridge Cleaver, a bunch of egotists can't even get along or what does that mean? The psychedelic and the political are irreconcilable. There was these fancy-headed psychedelic people wanting visions, and these realistic gun-toting political people. Power comes out of the barrel of a gun. And we thought we had them together, but it wasn't together. In fact, Leary's lawyer boasted when he left jail, boasted in the Berkeley Barb that it was the true merit of dope and dynamite when Leary left with the um, weatherman. And then there's this denouement in Algiers where they're fighting among themselves. And so Michael Zwerin of the Village Voice went over there and made a TV 
uh, video tape of the two of them arguing, which ran for two separate issues in the Village Voice, and was like a classic left-wing movement, intellectual poetry, psychedelic scandal that they couldn't get along and they were suspicious of each other and what kind of revolution was this and who was on whose side and was Leary wrong or was Cleaver wrong? So it all boils down to the fact that the FBI forged one of these letters from the Black Panthers in New York ordering Cleaver to arrest Leary as a spy, which, which information only surfaced when Leary and Cleaver, both together in jail, had Thanksgiving <laughs> supper, I think it was in 75, and began comparing notes. <laughs>